Well, welcome. And today we have author Kayleen Reeser. She is from Indiana and has written several books about World War II. Thank you. <laughs> and um, she has interviewed over 260 World War II veterans. So welcome, Kayleen. Oh, thank you so much, Raina. I'm thrilled to be here. All right. And where in Indiana are you again? I'm in Northeast Indiana, which is near Fort Wayne. Fort Wayne is uh, the second largest city in the state. So it has given me a lot of opportunity to find World War II vets there over the past decade or so. Yes. And I was telling you that I have, my best friend lives in Fort Wayne. So we didn't even know that we had a, con a little bit of a connection. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, you come and visit and I'll come and buy you a something. <laughs> <laughs> we have great food in Fort Wayne. Well, there's a chocolate. Is it De DeBrand's chocolate? I was just going to mention that. <laughs> yes, I've been there. It's very oh. good. <laughs> oh, super good. Yeah. Well, I can take you back. Yes. Well, okay. So you have several books that you have um, written about World War II. So how did you get started on this amazing journey of wanting to interview veterans? It wasn't a purpose-filled um, idea. In fact, I was writing for our local newspaper about 2011, and uh, my editor asked me to interview a World War II veteran who lived in our area. And I am a very proud Air Force wife and mother, so I was always willing to help promote the military in whatever way I could via my writing. So I did go to interview a man who had been a Marine in the Pacific during World War II. Now you have to remember, I knew absolutely nothing about World War II. I barely knew the date that Pearl Harbor was bombed and, and even the, which countries we were in. So when he very patiently talked with me, I was very appreciative because he was using words like Tinian and Tarawa and Peleliu and it sounded to me like he had marbles in his mouth. Well, those were all islands that the Marines were trying to take over to get closer to the mainland of Japan to have a major invasion there and end the war. Uh, he showed me his shadow box, which was quite large. It was uh, where he had all of his medals displayed. He had two purple hearts, which means he had been injured twice. And I came out of that interview feeling like I had been sitting in front of a living piece of history. And I have always loved museums and take, we took our kids to museums whenever we were on vacation. But this was a person who actually helped make history. And it just made me want to interview other World War II vets. Now about 10 years ago, there were a lot more World War II vets than there are today. And um, sadly, a lot of them are gone, but I did um, actively try to devote actually most of my Saturdays to trying to find one or two to interview because I was working during the week in a middle school library and just touching base with people. And of course, social media helped to find names. It was a neighbor or a, a dad or a friend or an uncle and just doing that, I tried to um, get as many as I could. And at this point, it's 260. Wow. You know, I, my dad is a retired colonel in the National Guard. And Ooh. I went, I went with him to the VA for something. And there were a lot of um, veterans there at that time. And we're in the elevator with the man, oh, you could tell he was a World War II vet, and he had it on his hat. And yes. I got choked up. I literally, I'm sitting at this table watching all these men and some women. And you just think of the bravery and the sacrifice. <laughs> in, in, yes. in, for, me, for me, they were all in one room. And so I was very emotional. <laughs> and I just think of all the stories there that's part of our country. And, you know, I, I like reading books and hearing stories about the generals like MacArthur and Patton, but it's those men and women, by the way, I have interviewed about 20 women. Um, it's, they're the ones that made it happen. 
there weren't enough generals to make it happen. There were about 16 million, some reports say 16 and a half million men and women who were part of the military. And some of those volunteered too, by the way, they, for the most part, were drafted, but a lot of them volunteered to serve um, because it did start with um, the invasion of um, Pearl Harbor on December 7th, 1941. Uh, but but Europe had been at war since 1939. So it was um, new for us, but it was a good thing we got in there because England was really struggling and Russia. So we were um, helping them by sacrificing on our end. And, um, you know, General, I'm sorry, President uh, FDR, <laughs> Roosevelt, I was going to say Eisenhower, uh, he really believed we could win. And our, our military was small compared to many countries in the world. We ranked, I, I, I'd have to look it up again, but I think we were down in the 40s as to the size of our military at the beginning of World War II. In fact, I have had some of the men tell me that they didn't even have enough guns to practice with shooting uh, or drilling even. At the beginning of the war, they used broomsticks to, to practice, They you know, holding them even. And, and then they would have had uh, bags of flour that they were dropping from the planes to use as targets to to try to aim for. And um, it was quite amazing. But because FDR really pushed people, they did it. And, you know, it just is an exciting time to read about. So I mostly read nonfiction books, but I do love reading um, World War II fiction as well. So we talked about Sarah Sundin. I remember when you interviewed her this year and very interesting um, interview, but she's a great author. I've read most of her books. And so I'm glad we could connect through her. Yes. And, you know, that is one of the things that um, I really like about your books. And right now I'm reading um, Battle of the Bulge stories from mm -hmm. those who fought and survived. And it does not read like a statistical informational. It, mm -hmm. it, it's really written in a pleasing way. Um, you've got uh, journals from the soldiers, some of their journal um, uh like snapshot of their journal kind of a thing. Yes. And then you've got us. Uh, this is the book, right? Here. Yes. <laughs> yes. And then you've got, you know, parts of a military publication in there. And then the photos that um, of the soldiers that you're reading about, you know, um, it's just a really, you know, interesting read. And uh, one question I did have though, while we're on this subject is how do you go about organizing all of that and determining what you want to keep and what you want to cut. You know, when I'm editing, it's like, I want to keep everything, but you can't. <laughs> it is. That is a big decision. In fact, I have to even design the covers. So that's always been a challenge for me because that is not what I would consider my strength at all. But I, and I, for the, a lot of the books, by the way, I do use photos of the men and women who are in the book. Oh, dear. Did I lose you? Nope. Oh, okay. There we go. Um, for instance, there's one other one. But I do uh, try to, when I was doing the interviews, I tried to, I was scanning them. I had a handheld scanner. It was about a foot long and it had a tiny microchip in it. And I would scan all their pictures. So the interviews could last like an hour and a half. And I would always think, oh gosh, I bet they're so tired, you know, from talking. But actually, they looked really energized because this was such a big deal for most of them. So whenever I would choose a topic to write about, I would go to the vets who were part of that, like the D-Day or uh, a POW, and look at their pictures. Those are my first choices to put in because those most of them had never been published before. So and I do have some National Archives photos in my books, but more to just give a, a unique example. If a guy uh, had been on one of those ships, I would, you know, put a picture of that ship in there. Uh, but, but yeah, it's hard to decide and I have to do the layout as well. So 
<laughs> it's a lot of work. And yet it's kind of challenging because it's different than working with words. And so sometimes I've done nine books on World War II, so I should probably feel like I know what I'm doing. <laughs> but I always feel like, oh my gosh, oh, did I remember, how did I do that last time? But, but at this point I can do it and I, I love it actually. Um, I have a couple books, we can talk about that in a little bit, but I do have a couple projects for 2022. And I just finished the Battle of the Bulge book, which you mentioned earlier. That was, this is my newest book. It just came out in July. And it, it of course, Battle of the Bulge started in December, but I wanted to get it done in time for people to, to have it in their hands if they wanted to give a, um, uh, give it as a present for Christmas. So, but normally I do bring books out around Veterans Day. Very nice. Know? And, and, and I so, used to do, oh, I'm sorry. No, I am sorry. You go ahead. I just was going to say I used to do book launch events where I would invite the vets who were in the new book to come to a big area room that I had rented and have them be the guests of honor. And they would be seated around the room and people could purchase the book and then have them come and sign the page where they're story would be like this man here he attended one and he his story is in the book and and it would be like they would sign it right here so that would make those books like heirlooms because of course most of the men are gone now yes yes and and so um you know i'm partway through the, the battle of the bulge book so can you kind of give us an example of how like what people would find in there in the book Sure, sure. Um, this one was is very unique because I was given a story by a man who I haven't met, but he lives in Iowa, and I did interview him then uh, over, I think we did Zoom or Skype or one of those, uh, but he had kept his uh, notes. He had written them after the war, but he worked for a newspaper and the people at the newspaper encouraged him to write down thing, his, you know, make it his memoirs. And he did that, but he didn't do anything with it. And then some, he's on Facebook <laughs> and he heard about what I do. And he said, Hey, would you be ever interested in using my work in one of your books? And I, excuse me, read through it and they were great. They were great. And so I enjoyed doing that. Then I also decided to put in some entries from a publication called Stars and Stripes. And this was a special uh, battle, I'm sorry, um, well, Battle of the Bulge uh, excerpt or edition. I guess that's the word I want. Uh, it was a special Battle of the Bulge edition where all of the stories in this uh, were about the Battle of the Bulge. And in fact, this is, it was published in 1944 and 1945. I had gotten it from the estate sale of a vet in one of my books. And I was like, oh, wow, this is so cool. And because it was government, uh, the, the Stars and Stripes magazine, it was public domain and the stories stories give people um I, I hope at occasionally a lighter look at what the soldiers lives were like during that time because some of the stories were are kind of hard to read uh, when there's there were a lot of men killed during that battle it was pretty pretty rough the weather was as much of an enemy as the germans were so um, it was considered record cold temperatures at that time, around 30 below zero wind chill. I don't even like to be in my house when it's 30 below wind chill, but these guys were living basically outside, uh, sleeping in foxholes. My husband and I actually have stood in one of the foxholes that would have been used outside of the city of Bastogne, Belgium. And that made me emotional. <laughs> as well. 